Cześć, tutaj Michał, słuchacie Linux for Everyone również w Polsce. Witajcie w domu. Hey everybody, welcome back to Linux for Everyone, the show about desktop Linux open source software and the community creating and enjoying it. My name is Jason Evangelo and I think I've got a fun one for you today. We are going to have another special appearance by Liam Daw from Gaming on Linux to tell us about a new game that kind of raises the bar for how we think about open source games. Plus, I have some listener feedback to share about the uh, the Dual Booters rant and Salient OS. And then we're going to get into a really cool interview with community member and content creator Shickle. So let's jump right into it with a brand new Linux gaming report. Linux for everyone. But how about a little gaming for everyone? Well, that's why I'm here. Hi, everyone. It's Liam. I wanted to talk about something a little different, and this might shock you too. I'm going to mention open source and gaming together. Crazy, right? Well, not so much. When you think about open source Linux gaming, you probably think something like Supertux Cart. An absolute classic, sure, good for kids, okay, but what about something a little bit more involved? I give you Mindustry. Mindustry is like an absolutely glorious blending of Factorio, so you have mining with factories pulling up resources, and conveyor belts spreading across the map. But then it also blends in a tower defense game, as you're pumping resources to special towers, and then you face off against waves of enemies while you try to gather resources. What's awesome about Mindustry is how amazingly polished it feels. It's probably one of the best open source games around. With a single player campaign support, it's got multiplayer. There's a research system for some progression. There's multiple different game modes and even a level editor. Mindustry is basically setting a new gold standard of what open source games can be. Hundreds of people play it. The developer even released it on Steam where right now I'm looking at it, there's over 600 people playing it and there's an overwhelmingly positive rating from Over 3,000 reviews is just doing amazingly well. You know what else is amazing about Mindustry? It's mostly a one-person operation. Let that sink in for a moment. How crazy is that? A single person doing the majority of the work has made such an amazing game. There are other contributors, of course, especially with it being open source and it's available on GitHub. There's quite a lot of other people that have done small patches here and there, but the majority of it is one person and it blows my mind what people can do. So there you have it, Mindustry. I'm a big, big fan. You can find it on Steam where you have to pay for it or you can find it on itch.io where you can download it free or donate if you wish as well. Absolute recommendation on that one. All right, so I've got three little uh, post-segment notes for you. Number one, Alan Pope, otherwise known as Popey over at Canonical, told me that there's also a Snap available for Mindustry, and it's got over 2,000 downloads. So if you're looking for a really easy way to get that game installed and don't want to use something like Steam or Itch, then the Snap Store is where you should go. Number two, the the little music bed you heard underneath Liam's voiceover was taken from the actual game. I went into the uh, the game's GitHub repository, dug into the audio files, and pulled out the menu music and pulled out uh, a track called Game 3, which is uh, some of the gameplay music during one of the maps. And note number three... Liam and I actually teamed up to produce a video about Mindustry, which you can find over at youtube.com slash Linux for everyone. So if you want to get a sneak peek at the gameplay as well, head over to the Linux for everyone YouTube channel. We're going to be turning the Linux gaming report into a monthly video series as well. So I really hope you guys can show up to the channel. There's a lot going on over there. 
And of course, a big shout and thank you to Liam at GamingOnLinux.com for spreading that indie Linux gaming love around. Check out GamingOnLinux.com for a daily dose of that stuff. And while I'm dishing out the thank yous, I want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Linux for Everyone. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform out there. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and so much more. You can get all of that, plus access to their great customer support for as low as $5 per month. Now, the entire Destination Linux network has teamed up with DigitalOcean to offer new customers two months for free, and on top of that, you get a $100 credit. All you have to do is go to do.co slash dln. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with that $100 credit by going to do.co slash dln. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode. Last week, I uh, had a bit of a monologue about dual booting and the way that the community treats people who do that and, and how we should go about encouraging new users to, to really get into Linux without being, you know, kind of elitist about it. Well, I got a great email response from Moro about this, and I wanted to read it in its entirety because he takes a slightly different approach. Hey, Jason. Personally, I never encourage new users to dual boot, especially when less tech-savvy users do not know what they're doing. They look for guides online and blindly copy-paste commands. This can lead to disasters either immediately or later on, such as breaking the bootloader, preventing both operating systems from booting. And this can create such a painful experience to new users that they might turn their back on Linux and never want to try it again. Instead, what I do is I ask them to take a slow approach to it. First, keep the OS they have. Install Linux in virtual machines on their Windows or Mac OS. Then they can VM distro hop as much as they want, play and break things and have fun with no risk. And a Linux virtual machine that runs in full screen isn't bad at all to run most workflows. They still can keep playing Windows games or using macOS software they purchased and are familiar with. Then, after a while, if they still want to use Linux and want to install it on the hardware, I recommend they remove the Windows drive and store it away. If this is not possible, then we'll take a Windows recovery media or use Clonezilla. Then, install Linux. And the first thing I do is use KVM to install a Windows virtual machine. We can install the software they need and are familiar with and give them sort of a panic room where they can do their work until they are completely familiar with Linux. Long story short, I take a slightly different approach from yours, but you know what? I am not right and you are not wrong. The world is beautiful because we're all different. So let's embrace our differences, learn from each other, and have a lot of fun. Thanks for the wonderful work you are doing. Best regards, Moro. And honestly, I have nothing more to add to that because those are some great words of wisdom. Thanks for writing in. I've got another email here from Peter, who answered the call to try out Salient OS, and here is what he had to say. I was going to install Pop! OS on my desktop based on my positive experience using Pop! OS on my notebook. After you and the community pointed to Salient OS, I got curious and checked out the videos from Silent Robot on YouTube. I was using Arch Linux before, but I couldn't build it the way I expected. But with Salient OS, a new hope was born. I was trying Manjaro as well, but somehow I just could not get on the wave. So I made a leap and installed Salient OS KDE Edition on my desktop, and besides some minor modifications and tweaks after installing, I can tell that this is the most complete rolling distro I have ever met. I'm an amateur photographer and like to play games also. I'm so happy that a game I was playing on the same hardware the day before on Windows 10 works flawlessly on this Linux system via Proton. Also, all of my preferred photography-related tools are available with the latest version without Flatpak or Snap. 
Also, knowing that, in my opinion, the greatest online documentation, the ArchWiki, is there to assist even in case of a weird question, makes a pretty strong foundation for Salient OS as well. To summarize, I will recommend Salient OS to anyone who is seeking a Linux distribution for gaming purposes. But to be honest, I think all modern Linux distributions are great for gaming, and it's hard to choose. Kind regards, Peter. Thanks a lot, Peter. Appreciate the email. And uh, if you guys want to get in touch with me for any reason whatsoever, all you have to do is fire up your email client and send it to linuxforeveryone at pm.me. So my very special guest on episode 29 of Linux for Everyone is Clayton. You may know him as Shicken or Shickle or Shicken Nuggets or Grandpa McShickleson on Telegram. (laughs) He is uh, an awesome community member, an elementary OS enthusiast and purveyor of wonderful Telegram stickers. How are you today, dude? I am fantastic. Thank you so much. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm on my second cup of coffee. Uh, it's it's Tuesday, and, which means it's not Monday. So that's already, you know, an advantage because it's closer to Saturday. But uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just in like content production mode and loving life right now. So aside from the weather, it'd be nice if spring actually started to rear its head a little bit. How's the weather where you are? Where do you where do you live? I live in Arizona. Uh, that's southwest U.S., middle of the Sonoran Desert. So it's kind of rough so is it like the snowy part of arizona or the always hot part of arizona oh it's the always hot part of arizona (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh yeah before we get into it i have to ask you one question i love origin stories and i'd love to hear kind of how you got your start with linux well i had a laptop back in i'd say 2015 um and that was around the time when windows 8 was a big thing love it or hate it it was it just happened i was one of the weird people who loved it way too much but manufacturers had a habit of always putting windows onto laptops that really weren't qualified to be running windows anyway um Mm. and that kind of just low low spec oh yeah um yeah i think it was like a dual core amd power hungry pretty much super budget tier but i decided it was a good idea to look for alternatives and I didn't really go in with any prep. I just clicked on the first link I saw on Google and immediately downloaded the ISO, which happened to be Zubuntu. Um, Zubuntu was the first result. Yeah, that was weird. The, it was so strange, and I might I might have searched for um, more efficient alternatives to Windows or something like that. So I think that uh, might have okay. been why. And thus you get you get the XFCE yes. flavor. Yeah, and I will be honest with you. I'm a little more fond of XFCE now than I was then, because coming off of something like the Windows 8 UI to XFCE felt like going back in time. If you just install vanilla XFCE today, it's acceptable, but it's it's not going to blow you out of the water, and it does kind of look like it's uh, at least 10 years old in terms of just user interface design and and just kind of the way it looks. But man, it is like you can do so much with it with only a few minutes. You can make it look so much better. Yeah, so, it's scarily flexible. <laughs> so that was your introduction to XFCE and to Ubuntu and to Linux. It was. And I didn't stay for too long on Ubuntu. When I realized how easy it was to just install another OS, like <laughs> it just it became an issue really quick. I think after that, I I tried Ubuntu. Uh, Unity scared me. I didn't understand it. It mm. was unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, and then I think I ended up on Mint as my as my go-to shortly after. Oh, okay. Okay. Mint was supposed to be my first one. But at the time, like when I made that switch back in 2018, I kind of had this operating guideline to where like, if I run into one problem 
during installation, I'm done and on to the next one. And Linux Mint didn't see my uh, SSD. So I was like, okay, on to Ubuntu. That's a hard one to get by. <laughs> yeah, it's a really hard one. And I didn't know how to bypass it. And I didn't, at that time, I didn't have any kind of community to ask for help. Now, we all know, I'm looking at your um, mug in the background, oh, yes. which I also have. It's a very tasty mug. You've got an elementary mug there with the black logo. Um, obviously, you have moved on from Linux Mint. Yes. But why? Ooh, what led to that? That is kind of a weird one. Um, I stuck with Linux Mint for quite a while. Um, when I switched to Linux, I didn't really make a backup of anything. So I had no way of undoing what I did. So I kind of just figured, well, I'm, I'm in the woods now. I might as well just live here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So um, from there, I just kind of started picking it apart more and more. And it was actually um, back in the day, Rocco from um, Destination Linux and Big Daddy mm -hmm. Linux, um, he co-hosted a podcast with someone named Rob and they, it was called... Um, actually, I think it was Destination Linux, but it was way, way, way back in the day. Um, and I would watch their videos, and they kept showing off other operating systems. They'd talk about things like Manjaro and Solus. Mm -hmm. After becoming familiar with Linux through them, seeing what they would do and, and the community members they would talk with, it compelled me to start trying other things. And from there, I switched off to Manjaro which um, was a really jarring experience at first because I had only ever really used Ubuntu-based distributions for a solid almost 10 months. And then I just kind of switched onto Manjaro. But by this time, uh, I had actually switched all of the machines in the house to Linux. So everything was running with, with or without permission? Uh, mostly without. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet there are some stories there. Yeah. I did my best to make sure it was a smooth experience, but uh, needless to say, I, I did have to do a little bit of troubleshooting. What was jarring about Manjaro? Jarring about Manjaro? <laughs> it's kind of a strange <laughs> wordplay. When I got into it, uh, I had just barely become familiar with apt and updating my system, installing packages, changing things um, through the apt package manager. Um, I had gotten past the point where I was relying on the GUI tools to do it. Um, because to me, for some weird reason, despite the fact that I've never really been in a case where I needed to use a terminal, I just felt comfortable doing things through the terminal. I think it just made me feel more powerful. So when I switched over to Manjaro, I had to learn very quickly what the concept of a package manager actually was in that apt was not the package manager. Apt was just a package manager. And the way hmm. um, package management is done on Arch feels very different. To people who've been doing it, it makes perfect sense. They're just like, yeah, no, it makes total sense. Like, what are you talking about? But when I was getting onto it, I was like, why would I, you know, my update string not just say update? Why is it like tack S Y Y U? Like, <laughs> these mean nothing I to know. me. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was it took me a while to become familiar with that and also to become familiar with the concept of packages that don't come from your repos, but they come from like external sources like the AUR and they get mm, built okay. on your machine. Like that was wild to me. I, I had that same experience the first time I started using Manjaro and Arch just kind of as my little whirlwind tour of, you know, distro hopping and exploration and all that and. I just didn't get it. I didn't get the package manager for Arch at all, but I kind of fell in love with the fact that every package I looked for was in the AUR. Especially for those who like tweaking things a little bit more, um, I guess things that come from the AUR, they're packaged in a way that lets you adjust how it's installed and how it's built. This is actually a little bit beyond my understanding. Do you know more about this? Like what kind of, in what ways you can tweak a lot of times when you're building a package, there's a lot of pre-configured options to how it's built. And this can change anything from like what architecture it's built on and what it, uh, like what instruction set it'll support. Some things are built with like Java. Um, if you want like a purely Java free system, like 
sometimes you could just disable certain connections to other parts of the system. And it also, I, I, I think in some cases, you can change how many cores it uses, how much oh, of no those kidding. cores it uses. Yeah, it, it's really flexible, but it does wow. require you to go in and like manually edit like a text file um, before sure. you build it. So you didn't last long on Manjaro. Uh, I stayed for about six months, um, and I came back to it every now and then. Um, but that um, that phase was kind of where I had one machine that was always sort of consistent, but I would change like a test machine or my secondary uh, laptop at the time, and I was jumping from um, Fedora to Solus to I think OpenSUSE actually for a while. Mm. And that uh, experience with OpenSUSE, while I, I wasn't totally happy with it on the desktop, it actually convinced me to run it on a couple of my file servers in the house. Um, I was using U Ubuntu server because that was kind of the first area I was introduced to. But once I experienced OpenSUSE, like it was just so easy to set up, and it you know the BTRFS configs that they have was really nice. So that was uh, yeah, OpenSUSE was my first experience with ButterFS. And I kind of fell in love with it. I'm actually thinking about going forward using that instead of VXT4 because I completely borked an update. And I just, um, in fact, it was Richard who was the uh, the chairman. Um, he actually responded on Twitter and walked me through it. He's like, yeah, just hit this command and you'll just roll it back. And I did and it felt like magic. That is awesome. It was It was brilliant. I need that in my life because I'm still a noob. I need to be able to undo my mistakes, you know? It's so easy to break things, especially, you know, especially when you kind of take something and you start running with it. You're like, oh, I've got this now. And then, well, no, you don't. No, no you don't. <laughs> At least I don't. <laughs> so is elementary OS where you landed after Manjaro? Uh, it was actually Solus. I was kind of hesitant about Solus for a while just because it seemed like such a small project and I'm usually a little hesitant to kind of put my eggs in that ba in that basket just because I don't know if the support will be there if I need something or I don't know if I experience a bug I'll ever be able to get it fixed. Um, yeah. So I tend to stray more towards things where I feel comfortable in the support and the longevity of it. Um, but I was really fascinated by the project at that time, um, after I had tried it, the speed of the boot times, the, the performance I had in games was rather significantly better than every other distro that I was using. And at the time I didn't quite fully understand how they were achieving this. So, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research since then looking into it. And I really like the way they've built their system. For those who don't know, I'm pretty sure that, that Solus is one of the few distributions that's actually not based on something else like Arch or not based on Debian or Ubuntu or whatever else. But it's it's kind of a Linux that they built from scratch. Does that apply to the installer as well? Or are they using something like a, a Calamari's or... Yeah, so they, they did actually write their own installer, and it's using uh, GTK technologies, so um, it's still based off of like current toolkits, but the actual installer itself is, is totally uh, specific to Solus, and um, one thing that they do with it is for UEFI, which is what most modern laptops use to, to start up the, the computer and the operating system, is they use something called System Deboot, instead of grub mm. which is what gives you like a menu to boot into like yeah. windows or linux or whatever um and it's very easy to kind of wipe over existing entries with this so that was something that i always had to watch out for because mm -hmm. it doesn't install grub so you don't get that menu for other operating systems not at all uh no but you you can add them manually but it's a bit of an involved process if I wanted to install Solus alongside Windows, how does that end up once the installation's finished? Oh, so um, one of the really cool things about uh, UEFI over like the legacy system is that instead of looking at the beginning of the disk for the information about what whatever you're booting, it mm -hmm. actually looks for a specific type of partition 
and it doesn't matter where it is on the disc or even what disc it's on. It's just looking for like that boot flag or yeah. or whatever is on. Yeah. So Windows will have one. And what you can do is instead of installing Solus's bootloader to the Windows one, you can actually create a second one uh, for Solus itself. So that way they never touch each other. Um, you know, Windows points to its own partition. Solus points to its own. Oh, man, I can think of one amazing advantage to that right off the bat. And that is when you have Windows already installed, and you're going to install Linux alongside that on a different partition, you have to turn off something in Windows 10 called fast startup. But sometimes a Windows update will actually override that setting like it does with many other settings that you choose or opt out of. And that would make it uh, nearly impossible to boot your Linux distribution until you go back in and disable fast startup again. So if these are existing on separate partitions and the you know that boot partition isn't interfering, then that's not an issue. Right. They shouldn't touch each other in that regard, which means you don't have to worry about maybe it overriding the partition or um, yeah. fast boot affecting it because it doesn't that's need really to care about what state the file system is in because it mm-hmm. doesn't touch the file system at all. Well, I'm really curious to look at their installer now because um, I did this this recent video called Install Wars. And uh, I got some comments about, well, I got many, many comments saying you really need to try Solus if yes. you think that Manjaro is fast. I don't know who it was. Someone in the Telegram group tried the Solus installer kind of in the same setup that I have and very, very similar hardware. And it finished in 95 seconds. The installer for me finishes in just under 45 seconds. What? Yeah. <laughs> 45 seconds. And it boots Are you in now- 2.3 seconds. What kind of machine do you have? Um, I It's a Ryzen 7 2700, um, but it's All on right, so it's Samsung NVMe. Respectable. Yeah. Yeah, so it's an NVMe. It's a nice, yeah, a nice speedy Ryzen 7, but that's still... It's really insane. <laughs> wow. I actually wrote a, qu- a short little guide. Um, for dual booting Solus, um, on their forums. So if you search, uh, dual boot Solus, it should probably come up. Um, I kind of show like a couple pictures inside of G parted for how to, um, make sure the, like the boot flags for Windows, uh, ESP is turned off. So the Solus installer doesn't see them or doesn't touch them, which should help you with separating the install from the Windows one. Okay. Nice. Nice. I'll put that in the show notes too. Let's talk about elementary, dude. Let's just talk about elementary. I love talking like, about what, it. <laughs> what, <laughs> what led you there? I first tried it, ooh, I think it was Loki, or it might have been just before Loki. And when I tried it, it was the design of it was so different from everything else I've used. Uh, the layout of it just didn't make sense to me. Um, not being able to like add a PPA like right away threw me off. Yeah. Uh, there's like a separate mm-hmm. package for that. So everything about it when I first experienced it, I was just not interested in. And and the name threw me off as well. It's like Elementary OS. So I figured the reason it's probably like this is because it's it's for kids. It's not for me. But when I finally went back to it, I, I decided to give it a solid go in an open mindset rather than expecting it to work like everything that I'm used to. I wanted to go into it expecting it to work the way it was designed to work and see if that would fit with what I wanted to do. I spent about three or four months with it. Um, I made a couple videos about it, about what I do, like tweaking it. At the time, I was big on tweaking it. So I would change the theme. I would add like double click. I would enable, I would change the way the terminal remembered your position. Did you add a minimize button? I did actually. I had a, I had a minimize button and the maximize item all together on like the right side. It was definitely not very elementary, but over time, you know, seeing the, the changes that elementary has made and how well thought out everything they do is in their design process and it's so well communicated it made it so easy for me to understand why something was the way it was and that helped me learn how to use it most effectively because i knew what the purpose of there not being a minimize button i i it led me to the realization that workspaces are a really good way to kind of organize everything that i'm doing and when I have a bunch of tasks open, if I need to minimize something, 
it's probably not worth being in the same space as all of the stuff I'm actually focused on. I don't know if it was Cassidy or Daniel who was talking about this, but uh, I I chatted with one of them for a Forbes article that I'd written when I first tried elementary. And they were telling me that there is a there's an undercurrent, there's there's more of a driving force behind the no minimize button than just this is how we want it to work. Oh yes. They are really bullish about apps being smarter, right? Yes. Very so much. an app needs to be smart enough to know that if you just close the window, it's saved. Don't worry about it. Yes. You see that kind of behavior with all of the apps that people are writing for elementary in the app center. Close something like code or close I don't know, whatever whatever other note-taking app or, you know, take your pick. But you just close it, no worries. Open it back up. It's right where you left it. Everything is saved. You didn't have to do, like, file save or save as. It's just there. And it's so convenient, it's smart. too, for a whole bunch of reasons. One, uh, like, I just saw a meme go around about how Windows is like, oh, you have unsaved work? Well, I need to update anyway and restart. <laughs> the thing is, is if you're closing things you might not be closing them because you're ready to like save the file and name it and organize it. You're probably yes. closing it because you need to do something else. You're just getting it out of the exactly. way. Exactly. So it's so nice it, that it's just so quick and easy to close things. Like th there's something so frustrating about a computer waiting after you tell it to close something and asking you mm -hmm. if you want to save it. Like, are you sure you want to close? Yeah, it's such... Are you sure you want to save? Bad feeling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, it's like, yes, I'm sure. That's why I did the action. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been using elementary OS now? It has been my daily driver for about three years. Dude, so that's like 75% of that your Linux That is most career. of the time I've been on Linux, okay. yes. It's All right. kind of wild. So I've kind of watched it grow in a lot of ways. Um... Looking back on it, though, I see screenshots of what elementary used to look like almost eight to ten years ago, and it's just otherworldly. It looks nothing like it used to. They've come so far. I think one of the things that makes it so exciting to me is that they're always driven on progress, and they're always driven on refining things because it can always be better. And they put so much effort into trying to understand why something should work the way it does and how to make it easier for people. Like accessibility is a huge thing with elementary. They've done blog posts on, on why accessibility isn't, I think the term was accessibility features are just features. You know, they, they shouldn't be like something behind a, a separate wall. Like, like it's important mm -hmm. enough to be part of the experience because people need it. Right. That is honestly a field where I think Linux is lacking, lagging behind uh, Windows and Mac OS is accessibility and the scope of those accessibility features. Yeah, I'm with you, dude. I, I really, I really appreciate how transparent the elementary team is and how when they blog about something, it's not just here's this new feature and here's where you can get it. It's, it's, hey, we've listened to you and we've thought about this process ourselves, and we're introducing this new feature and here's its origin and here is a mock-up of how it started and here's why we're implementing this little part of the feature. And, you know, you just feel like you're kind of growing up with them and you're yeah. part of the process. And like I was telling you before the show, even if I were to switch away from elementary OS, it will be something that I will always be reporting on and always supporting and enthusiastic about because I just think that they have they have a mentality that is so progressive and so forward thinking that I think is I think the Linux world really needs. There's just so much around it and Cassidy, the mad lad, he just writes the the most comprehensive and unbelievably extensive blog posts about things. I just, I don't know how they have time to do all the things they do when they're I have no idea. writing things like that. Is there any other distro that has been tempting you, though? That's what I want to know. Ooh, so Are you looking at on the other side of the, of the <sighs> fence and going, man, that looks pretty sweet. I have been trying to behave myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really impressed with a lot of work that the, the KDE team has been doing. Mm -hmm. And 5.18 looks like a really, really solid release. 
And for a while, I was using um, Kubuntu with, I think, 5.17, so the release just before yeah. it. And it was a really, really good experience. Turns out when I have the option to, I customize everything to be very similar to elementary OS. So I had my dock on the bottom functioning hmm. in a similar way. I had my panel at the top with the menu on the top left. Like everything just feels so comfortable to me that way that I will kind of morph whatever I can into that form factor. In a way, I'm using something different, but am I really being all that different with it. If you're drawn to KDE, but you're adapting it to be more Pantheon and elementary-like, what do you like about KDE? Yeah, so, okay, that part is kind of where it gets interesting. Um, their design style is very different. Um, it's just drastic, like, everything's very sharply edged in KDE. Um, hmm. They have really nice transparency effects, yeah, uh, the blur yeah, is so pretty. It's very wobbly easy. windows. Yeah, wobbly windows, baby. I'm sorry, but I will always love that. Yes, it's so. I don't pretty. care if it's like out of fashion or whatever. I love wobbly windows. I was attracted to the way widgets worked. I liked being able to have like my system monitors and stuff just laid out on my desktop while mm. I had everything else going. Um, sometimes when things are open as a window. It's kind of hard to keep where you want it, but if I can just have my system monitors in a place where um, they don't move around, they're kind of a consistent shape and size all the time. I, I have an internal reference for, you know, what a representation of something on the graph means, because it's always at the same scale, it's always in the same position. So when I look at it, it takes me pretty much no time to know exactly what's going on with my system. But if I open up like a, a window for that kind of information, you know, depending on the position of it, the size of it, I, I feel like I just take more time trying to analyze it than a widget on my desktop. So that just kind of sped things up a lot for me. And another thing that I really appreciate about KDE is the ability to, um, they have like auto hiding panels and they have... Uh, this thing called Latte Dock, which um, it has a feature that lets you only show launchers on the dock and not your open windows. And what I would do with that huh. is instead of having the dock show all of my open windows that aren't pinned, I actually put them in my top panel, which auto hides. So when I switched tasks, it was in a hidden oh. drop down rather than being on my dock. I kind of like that because it, you know, sometimes I notice when I'm scanning my dock and I've got like 15 icons here at this point, right? And and I'm scanning that sometimes and it takes you that extra half a second to actually locate, oh, there's my open, okay, there they are. But an auto hiding top panel, that's an interesting idea. Well, I want to shift over to uh, talking a little bit about the stuff that you're making because you have a YouTube channel and uh, I'll have that link in the show notes. But recently, you have had some opinions coming out. Yes. I, I definitely have <laughs> been lighting. You've been on a very impassioned opinion <laughs> spree. And it started, I think it started with, there is no best gaming <laughs> distro. Sorry, folks. In which I, not that you were intending it, but I felt personally attacked <laughs> after my Pop! OS is perfect for gaming on Linux video. So I want to talk about this kind of stuff. I want to talk about, because that's not, everyone has an opinion of what distro is best, but then there are people like you and people like Chris Titus Tech who are saying, like, distros don't even matter. They're just, everything is just a puzzle piece that you can put together and assemble it for yourself the way you like. Yeah. So I'm kind of wondering where you stand on that, because, you know, you're very much an elementary OS enthusiast, yes. but you probably would not say that that is the best distro for gaming, would you? That would be correct, yeah. And it hurts me because I would love to. I really would love to. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what, what the point was that you were making in that video. Because on the surface, I mean, you're you're a master at titling, by the way, because I would click that instantly <laughs> because I disagreed, right? 
because I have my opinion on what is the best. I think it's Pop OS. Right. But um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about what what was behind that. Yeah. So um, I will admit I did read your article and I definitely knew that that would kind of be um, an area of engagement. I, I think everybody does have their preference, as you were saying, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't trade elementary OS in for almost anything if I could help it. I look at the way that I use my computer and, you know, I've got Steam loaded in, I've got um, Minecraft loaded up, and I do game, maybe not super heavily. But what I've noticed is that my experience across every distro can vary a little bit. But when it comes to performance, with very few exceptions, there's just been nothing that makes any one particular distro special over another Hmm. um i can achieve all of the same things um without any significant holdbacks um sometimes it is a couple extra steps but usually the complexity of those steps isn't much greater than what you're already doing i've been seeing a lot of people in the community um in the past four or so years that i've been using linux um, people are always kind of looking for help with things or trying to find something that works for them. And they do it by asking other people, which I think is good in a way. Um, but I think when everybody's answer is just going to be whatever they prefer, you also miss out on a lot of, well, does that really actually solve it for you? I think it, it it's actually part of a larger topic that I want to dig at, but I don't quite know how to do it yet in the the user experience and how insignificant it really is to reference other people's um, use cases to base your own on. When people ask, you know, like, what's the best distro for gaming? A ton of people jump in and tell them whatever they prefer to use. But the problem is, is they rarely look at the other things that the person needs to do as well how they expect ah, to be gaming. That's true. Um, yeah. You know, they, they never usually ask what they're gaming with either. Um, people who are super into, like, retro emulation games aren't going to really care much about Steam as much as they are things like, uh, I think it's called Mopin. It's an N64 gen um, emulator. Like, depending on what the person is doing and what other things they have to do, the kind of hardware they're running... I think it's really hard to just give someone a distro and say it's the best for gaming because we lack so much information about the rest of their perspective and their use case that it's hard to give them something that that's really good for them. It's like we, I, I think that we as a community, we need to be better listeners. We need to follow up like, someone's question with more questions, probably instead of going Hey, what's the best uh, Linux distro for gaming? Oh, it's Pop OS, and here's why. You know, then like you said, we, we need to say, well, how old is your machine? What kind of games are you into? Um, have you heard of things like Lutris? Do you know what that is? And getting, I mean, it's it's so much easier, though, to just make a, recommend, a blanket really recommendation is. than work with one person at a time. But that is, I mean, that is how you grow a community is one person at a time. And it's definitely difficult because it's hard to expect that from people. We're all just community members. None of us are paid to be here and support each individual user in troubleshoot shooting something. So it's definitely not like we have to do it. But I do feel like it's something that would not only help people in need of it, but also help us because it it does help build a stronger connection with each other. And in turn, you know, we grow from that. Um, we have a better understanding of how other people are using their machines and what might more be needed in the both in the community and on certain technical aspects as well. Do you think that so many of us, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm including myself in this too, because I do it subconsciously where I just make a recommendation, even though I, I try to get some information, but... I think I make that recommendation because it's what I'm familiar with and I can because I can help that person with that particular thing because I know it. But I'm wondering if our tendency to recommend what we like is kind of a, a symptom of, of um, tribalism and like tribal mentality. Even if we're not intending it to be, I want you to be part of my tribe. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm definitely guilty of that in a few ways. I've spent so much time with a lot of Linux distros, but I've had a focus on one particular thing for so long that it's gotten to the point where I feel very confident trying to help people with elementary OS issues um, because I've probably run into everything they've run into by this point because I have a habit of breaking things. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when I'm kind of giving someone a recommendation, I don't really want to sway them in a way that's that's biased. Um, but at the same time, I also want to be able to help them. And I know that if they're not using something I'm super familiar with, I probably won't be able to help them as well as I otherwise would. And that's difficult for me because I want to, but I don't really want to persuade them to use something that may not be the best option for them. So you followed up that video with a definite hot button issue. Yes. Uh, a very controversial issue that we probably will never get tired of talking about, but we'll always get sick of hearing about. Yes. <laughs> and that is toxicity and hostility in the Linux community. And uh, it's something that I've touched on as well when I was talking about, you know, not not shaming people for dual booting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this is a topic that I know hits home with you that you feel very strongly about. I really, really do. And I think part of it is because I've been on every side of the fence in that regard. I'm not very proud of it. Um, in my earlier days, I was really toxic and really opinionated. I had a tendency to spend a lot of time doing extra research on things that are rather archaic and arcane, and no one really needs to know. Um, but a lot of that led to me as sort of assuming baselines of knowledge about certain things without them really actually being baselines of knowledge. You know, I had strong opinions about the way things should work technically, and I didn't hold back on the way I behaved myself with other people. And I, you know, I pushed people away at times. What I learned from my experiences, I'm not going to help anyone by being aggressive or pushy or um, mm -hmm. being hostile in nature in, in any way. And the only thing that I get from it is stress. It's just a lot of stress to be an angry person because you're just hypertensive about everything that's involved. Like when you allow yourself to become so emotionally attached to something – you are going to feel the effect of everything that happens. And so if it's negative, you're going to feel a lot of negative energy. I'm still working on it as well. Sometimes I, I bark at people and sometimes I'm not super gentle with the way I word things. And it's something that I'm working on because I've seen people leave the community because of behavior like that. I've seen people come into rooms needing help and be bashed for whatever they're asking help for, like, why are you using that in the first place? Like, it's garbage. And uh, I've seen people call people terrible things because of the software choices they make, as if, you know, them as a person are any less than anyone else because they prefer to use this program or this library or whatever. And after being involved in so much of that, I realized that I had an opportunity to either be the person tearing people apart or try and be the person pulling people together. Not an easy balance to strike because I do care about a lot of the things that happen in these groups. And sometimes I have to set aside my own reservations to try and do the right thing. And at times I feel like um, and it's something that I talked about in the video. I feel like we're just on the sidelines when we could be doing something about certain situations. But I do feel like if you're in a group with 300 other people and like 100 of them are online and one person's just absolutely railing on someone for, for no reason, mm -hmm. how can no one say anything about it? You know, like I, I feel like at some point someone's got to realize that like we could at least – Either, if not confront the people being hostile, try and help the people who are being attacked and find a way around it without escalating the problem. I've been guilty of that myself, where I see some, not necessarily rule breaking or, you know, any kind of bannable offense, but just somebody being kind of 
trashy and, yeah. and mean. And I, I just, I sit there and I watch it play out, you know, hoping that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll resolve the conflict they're having or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, for me, I, I don't necessarily like confrontation much. And so it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for me to be that guy who, who gets in there and does the whole like, hey, can't we all just get along? Hey, look, I see your side. And look, I think he sees your side. And, you know, maybe we can meet in the middle. Let's just make it a little friendlier in here. And yeah, but it's, you're right. I mean, if we all made that effort and, and tried to curb that kind of activity right when it starts, we would be a healthier community, I think. Not that it's an unhealthy community. Man, like on a, on a personal note, I have been, I've been struggling with this a bit because I am always trying to be like this really upbeat, positive guy in the way that I cover things. But ever since I started um, getting a little bit more popular on YouTube, man, <laughs> I don't know why, but it seems like YouTube comments are slowly but steadily becoming this cesspool of hate. And it is tough to deal with. It's tough to see, like, that's my community acting like trash. Yeah. It's really difficult because not only is it sad to see uh, people that you you really want to engage with being so shut out or so aggressive towards other people, it's also just difficult because... If you do something about it, you do open yourself up to more attacks. There's the, anyone who really wants to be aggressive towards people is going to find any way they can to do it. So anyone who has a public facing platform of any size, it's inevitable. Let's let's be honest. It is inevitable that you're going to be attacked or, or something similar to that. How do you deal with it? Depending on the, the severity of what's going on. Um, Sometimes you see something and there's just no possible way you can say anything that's going to make anything better. Like if somebody pops into my comment channel and they're saying some super offensive uh, things or they're threatening death to whatever, sometimes like it's the internet, things like that happen. If it's super extreme, for me, I try really hard just to not take it personally. A lot of it is because I, I've been in a situation where I've just been so angry in, in the past that I hope that whatever it is they're going through it improves because i know that doesn't feel good huh. and i just remove it i don't want to censor anyone um, but i will remove anything that calls violence towards people or you know things like that but when it comes to people who are actually a little more engaged but really really hostile or negative and things like that i will try and set aside my own sort of stances on things at times and see where they're coming from. It's really difficult for me because as a child, I struggled with a lot of emotional and behavioral issues. And one of the things that I really, really had to learn about myself was how to separate myself from what I'm feeling and not act on it before, you know, I'm ready to. A lifelong pursuit. Yeah, that one. it really is. Yeah. I, I will probably never fully be there. It's something that I'm constantly learning to try and do what i've started realizing is that if i put myself on the same level that they are right if i start engaging in it and let it hit me personally i'm probably going to end up just fighting with them for forever like it won't end because i i become so personally invested in it which is difficult because it is personal it, it when you are making content, when you are spending hours of your life trying to share things with other people, you know, it, it's personal. It, that That is part of your life. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, having a thick skin is hard. It really is. I mean, I have been, a, you know, a content creator of some kind for like 14 years. It gets easier, but it never gets easy. Like one of the videos that I that I released last week, I spent 15 hours straight working on it, and it was only like a nine minute video. That's and I mean I just poured everything I had into that video, and it got popular, and I got so many comments that were like, "What a waste of time! Nobody cares about how long Windows takes to install. They only care about how it performs afterwards." And like, what trash this is! Why did you even bother? And <laughs> but then. I have to step back and look at, you know what? 
this has like a 95%, you know, upvoted percentage, yeah. and there's tons of engagement, and people are saying uh, that they enjoyed it. And it's, it takes effort, you really have to filter out that negativity. And it's difficult too, because a lot of the people that tend to be really negative are sometimes the loudest they will draw the most attention. It's <laughs> <is> so true. <laughs> it's like putting in earplugs and then the person grabs a megaphone. And I think I've come to the realization as well. And part of this was actually something that Alan Pope had said. Um, there was some ongoing topic about canonical, which everybody, you know, knows is a pretty easy target. Uh, he mentioned the term vocal minority. And that really struck a chord with me. When people are happy, they don't have a reason to complain. Um, when they're really happy, they'll tell you about it because it's, you know, it's over the top. It, there's a reason to be so satisfied. But when they're unhappy, it is so easy to complain about something you're unhappy with. People will put more effort into expressing dissatisfaction than they might do as expressing happiness. One of the, the one of the comments that I was referencing earlier on that YouTube video, this person was yelling at me on Reddit. They were yelling at me on YouTube, and then they tracked me down on Discord and sent me a DM on Discord to tell me pretty much the exact same thing. How sweet. Anyway. <laughs> Before you go, tell us where everybody can find you. Oh, um where where do you live on the internet? So I'm at Shickle on Twitter. Um that's C S C H Y K L E. Um, and then on YouTube, I'm Shickle, but the URL is actually Shicken. It was a dare, so. And you're, of course, in the Telegram group. Yeah. Um, Linux for everyone, Telegram group, and a bunch of others. Anyone can DM me on Telegram, um, at Shickle. That's my name on Telegram as well. Um, I'm on Mastodon, mastodon.social slash at Shickle. So um, I try and make it easy for people to find me. I might not always be able to answer things, but people want to reach out to me or if they have questions, I'm totally down to to have a chat with people so well dude keep producing videos keep helping people keep uh keep the positivity up and just stay the course you're doing a good job thank you well i think that's the end it might be <laughs> we can hit stop And that's going to wrap it up for episode 29. Thanks a bunch for being here and for subscribing and for engaging and all the great stuff you guys do. Remember to support Mr. Schickel over on Telegram, Twitter, and his YouTube channel. And you can check out the Linux for Everyone YouTube channel as well. There's new videos up every Monday and Friday. And if you want to support the show, go buy a coffee mug or a hoodie or a t-shirt. All the relevant links in the show notes for this episode. And until next time, remember to take care and take care of each other. See ya.